right hey YouTube how you doing thanks for clicking on my video hope everybody's doing well uh, today's video I'm going to talk about the code case of Alexander Harris the code case uh, it was around November of 1987 it was right around Thanksgiving uh, holiday that long weekend uh, what happened was the Harris's which is uh, the mother her name is Roxanne and she's Alexander's mother and then her dad which is Alexander's grandfather are leaving Las Vegas going back home to Mountain View California so what they do they stop at Whiskey Peach Casino which is about 65 miles or so south of Las Vegas it actually sets right on the California Nevada border so they pull off the side of the road. Back then, Whiskey Pete's was the main casino out there. Uh, so what they were going to do is uh, stop off and uh, do some gambling. So Lolo Alexander goes to the video arcade. She, she drops him off there. Uh, goes back 20 or 25 minutes later. This is around 11 a.m. that morning. And he's gone. Disappeared. Witnesses uh, come forward and they say that they saw a man and a boy leaving the arcade holding hands. They didn't think anything of it because it looked like a father-son situation. Uh, back during the trial, or right before uh, the trial, they're showing some footage on the nightly news of this abduction. But the footage is so grainy, you can't really identify anybody in the video. Stay with me to the end of this video because I go out to um, Whiskey Pete's and I find it, actually found a location where the mobile homes once sat and where they found the body of Alexander Harris. The police were called in and they immediately ruled out the family. Uh, there were two composites were made uh, based on eyewitness testimony. Uh, basically, a six foot tall guy weighing around 165 to 170. The next few weeks, nothing was found. The case was drawing immense pressure and it was uh, gaining nationwide attention. I remember this being on the news every night. Uh, 30 days later, they find a body under a trailer. He was still wearing the same clothes. His glasses were found nearby. He died of strangulation. Uh, three suspects were under consideration based on employees and hotel guest list. You know, when you check into a hotel, here in Nevada, they'll make a copy of your driver's license. Uh, two of the three suspects had pretty strong alibis, and a third uh, became the primary suspect, although eight people said they saw him at the Dry Lake Bed Tournament. His name was Howard Hopped, a computer programmer, who was staying at the hotel because he was attending a land-selling tournament. Uh, police were convinced they had their man. A little overzealous, I think. His picture was included in a lineup along with hotel employees who looked similar. Even though witnesses couldn't clearly pick Hopped out, out of the lineup pictures, police and the FBI still chose to move forward with the case. Hopped ends up leaving town, goes back to San Diego because the police just didn't have enough to charge him with anything yet. So what they do, they sent him a letter, if you can believe this, they sent him a letter and asked if he would voluntarily come back to Nevada to be questioned and photographed. That's kind of a joke. Hopped ignores this. I would have too. So the next thing that happens is the police fly in witnesses to San Diego to, to identify Hopped and they even go to his workplace, and what they do, they uh, pose as interior decorators. By the way, always remember that the police are allowed 
to lie to you. But what they're doing, they were pick and hopped out. They were identifying him as one of the people in the lineup. So it was a little bit biased, I think. So they were able to do this. Based on this, um, the police department now felt they had enough to arrest Howard Hopped. This is February of 1988. And what's interesting to me, uh, Hopped passes two lie detector tests. In addition to this, the print on the glasses did not belong to Hopped. So uh, the police department tries for three and a half hours to get him to confess and there were some questions of his civil rights being violated too. They end up going to trial. It lasted five weeks. The jury deliberated for 15 hours and came back with a not guilty verdict. Shockingly, huh? The jury stated that uh, based on the unreliability of the eyewitnesses and plus the fact that uh, Hopps' defense attorney, uh, Stephen Stein, pointed out all the inconsistent statements is the reason they came back not guilty. In the final days of the proceeding, as each side prepared to offer closing arguments, uh, Judge Stephen L. Huffaker, he was a Clark County District Court uh, judge who presided over this case, he actually concluded that he should advise a jury that there was insufficient evidence for conviction. Now, under Nevada law, a judge may offer the jurors his opinion on how they should vote. Although clearly that opinion is not binding, it's just a suggestion from the judge, and it, it, it is a law. Unusual, but uh, that's just how it is. But when uh, the judge called the uh, prosecution and de defense lawyers into his chambers to tell them of his plans, the roof fell in. Uh, Mel Harmon, the chief deputy district attorney, just went ballistic. <laughs> you can just imagine. In his words, uh, Mr. Hopp's defense attorney, who was Stephen Stein, uh, Harmon screamed at Judge Huffiger, telling him that if he did this, the blood of Alexander Harris would be on your hands. Uh, two days after that exchange, and by the way, uh, also uh, Tom Diller, the lead detective, on the case, also called the judge's office, spoke to him, and in the judge's words, he felt intimidated over this. So two days later, after that exchange between a judge and a prosecutor, uh, Judge Huffaker convinced that uh, he could not issue the advisory and that his independence had been compromised. Again, uh, he called the two in, two sides in his chambers. He wanted to read into the record all that had occurred during the previous 48 hours, in part so that a transcript of the second session in chambers would give Mr. Hop grounds for appeal in the event of a conviction. So I'm thinking that if he was convicted of murder and kidnapping, I'm thinking this probably would have went went a long way uh, to getting a um, uh, the the appeal. I would think it would have weighed heavily when Hop would have done the appeal on the case. So next thing that happens is Howard Hop sues Detective Tom Dillard and his partner for overzealous police work. Um, so it was filed with the judge Philip Pro, Philip M. Pro, who throws it out of court because he felt even though uh, Dillard and his partner were shoddy in their police work, he still said that Hopped got a fair trial. So he throws it out. Uh, Hopped 
and his attorney, attorney immediately filed with the Nevada Supreme Court who reviews the case. They reinstate it. Uh, it turns out that uh, Hopp was suing for $3 million and $1 million in punitive damages. And what ended up happening was that they settled out of court for a dollar amount that would pay Hopp's attorney fees. So that's how it, it ended up. Okay, we're at Whiskey Pete's. It's a rainy day overcast in Las Vegas. And this is where they stopped off on the way home from California. Okay, I'm out here at Whiskey Pete's today, and it's it's an overcast day. Can't really see too much, but from here I can actually see where uh, where the trailers were from lining lining them up with the mountain in the back. You can you can see that dip here in the mountain, and that's that's where I'm standing. I just don't think you can see it in the video here, but. Anyway, the trailers were right out in this area, right out here, and I'm back behind Whiskey Pete's. Uh, there's a hotel. Uh, since they've built this parking garage and some other things out in this area, So the, the uh, trailers is right out in this area here, and uh, what it was, it was the uh, trailer that belonged to the chef at the hotel, at one of the restaurants. So a lot of executives would stay in the mobile homes because it's quite a drive from Las Vegas. And this is where they found Alexander Harris underneath the chef's uh, mobile home. And I'll bring in some pictures so we can see it. Uh, we can see it a little more clearer. Maybe. It's just too bad it's an overcast. But I, I can make the mountains out here so it's right in this area. Uh, right out here is 15. And that's how you get to California. And if you look straight ahead, a ways again it's an overcast day you can't really tell but out this way is where the um, uh, the dry lake bed is and that's where and that's the reason that Howard Hopp came to town is to see the uh, the land selling races and then back this direction out this way to the left is Las Vegas And by the way, inside, inside Whiskey Pete's here in the casino park, uh, they have Bonnie and Clyde's car. And uh, I, I got a video on my channel uh, if you want to check that out too. So this is the main, the main casino right here. And this is the arcade. And this is where... Alexander Harris came in and played the arcade games and I believe this camera right here right there captured uh, them leaving together going through this door right here they went out this door and exited the casino. Here, this will give us a little better perspective of what it looks like out there. It's good to see the rain though because we only get four inches, four inches a year. So I was standing right back here 
and the mobile homes were in this area and you can see that by looking at these mountains the top of the mountains is how I was able to identify the area but if you come over here uh, by the way this wall is the state line this side's Nevada this side's California so Howard Hopped was in town for the uh, dry lake bed tournaments the land selling and I'll come up a ways you can see this whole area here is where they had the tournament so there you go I thought you'd like to know and and I'll see you at the top